Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this presentation. Now I have two presentations and I think the allocated time is something like an hour. I will try to cut that a little shorter so we have a little more time for question and answer. So now times of trouble, times of fraud is what I'm going to talk about. Many of you, all of you, I presume, remember this one, coronavirus, and then this one, that's the flag of the Ukraine. Let's take a step back and start with the corona crisis. I don't know what it looked like in, in the countries that, that you're in, but at least here in Central Europe, and I know also from, uh, from the US, it was the same picture. People basically stockpiled paper, all sorts of paper, including toilet paper, uh, basically the quantities they would normally use in, in two years. I don't know what people did with all the toilet paper, but there you go. So we found empty shelves. But more than that, it was not just the toilet paper that was stockpiled. It was also other foods uh, like uh, durable foods, rice, pasta, um, canned tomatoes, and so on that were stockpiled. Basically, what happened was um, the demand outpaced the supply by far. So under normal circumstances, the shelves would have still been stocked. But now, because consumers were basically panic buying, the shelves were empty because the food industry just simply didn't have the resources to cope with the additional demand that, you, that we saw. And, and also, of course, there were some, some uh, sicknesses, some, some deaths, all uh, basically impacting the supply chain. And what we saw as a consequence is that the prices and the demand were kind of basically prices were go up, demand was going up. So the typical scenario. And that is a scenario where very often food fraud happens. Now, the next slide is taken from uh, the IFST online library. It's basically food fraud incidents uh, data comparison. And what you can see, the, the dark green uh, is comparing the 2019, so more or less before Corona, with um, one year later, so basically when we have been in Corona. And what you can see, if you just look at the official sources here, you can see that the, there is already, based on Corona alone, um, that was before the Ukraine um, invasion by Russia started, uh, a significant increase in food fraud cases. So now we're having an even worse situation because previously it was Corona, well, we have some staff shortages and there were some disruption of the supply chain, but it was not really a shortage of materials that were produced. It was more a shortage of workers disruption because the lorry drivers couldn't pass the borders and so on. So now we have a significantly more severe situation. And here you can see, we're just looking at what the Ukraine and Russia produce. And when we look at the sunflower seed, so basically the oil and the cake that is produced from them, Russia and Ukraine produce more than half of the global quantity. That means those two countries, if there is no production or no export, there will be a very severe shortage of sunflower oil and, and cake. And then it's also a major producer of wheat and barley. So that will also impact on the disruption of supply chain, the shortages. So some countries have already positioned themselves to try and kind of alleviate some of the effects that we're seeing as a consequence of that. And the Canadian um, Agro-Food Policy Institute, uh, they published a report and this is taken from that report where they look at the different commodities and certainly Canada is one of the major producer of canola. So here they can, basically help um, to limit the impact of the shortages of sunflower oil because canola oil or rapeseed oil can 
kind of replace in some cases the sunflower oil. Now, when we're looking at the wheat where Ukraine and Russia are major producer, you can see that Canada and US do play a major role, but it's still limited. The impact will still be fairly severe. And of course, that triggers the concerns and quite rightly so of food fraud. And the more so if you look at the food price index, so this is taken from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and you can see the, this is the, the year, uh, so from January to December, and here you can see the curve for 2019. You can see the curve for 2020, so it was a little down here in April, May, it went up in November, December, and in 2021, that is basically the time of the corona crisis impacted it went significantly up already. And now look what happened when the Ukraine war started here in 2022. Basically, the prices exploded. And that is particularly for vegetable oil, for example, the sunflower oil that, that uh, where Russia and Ukraine is a major producer, but also for cereals. So here you have a significantly heightened risk of food fraud not only the impact of the corona crisis, but now on top of that, the lack of resources, the lack of sunflower oil and the lack of cereals. So now there are different types of food fraud that you can look at as gray market production, there's mislabeling, adulteration and counterfeiting. Some of them you can detect analytically, others more difficult. So here, gray market production is very difficult to detect that analytically. You need to have traceability, and we're coming to the traceability aspect that Sammy already mentioned a little later. And then you have mislabeling, of course, if you have the right tools and you can identify, for example, that a, um, a pine nut was replaced by a peanut, clearly you can identify mislabeling, a counterfeit, maybe the label is not the same as the original bottle, or maybe the content is not, and therefore you might also be able to analytically detect the, uh, the, uh, the fraud. But here, adulteration, that is certainly the one that can, in the vast majority of cases, be detected using analytical tools. And here we have different categories. We have dilution, so for example, if you place water in milk substitution that was the example already provided where the pine nuts the expensive pine nuts are replaced by cheap peanuts the unimproved enhancement sami mentioned the azo dyes so here for example for paprika if you add azo dyes to make the paprika look more reddish so it sells at a higher price that would be an unimproved enhancement concealment is basically when you blend um, a highly uh, high quality olive oil with cheap lampant oil. So there are different types and all of them can be detected and we're seeing how they can be detected later on. Now let's go back to the risk that we're facing with a current crisis. So I categorize that in two different groups. There are the direct risk, that is due to the agricultural production losses in the Ukraine and due to the actual agricultural export bans from Russia. And then, of course, the indirect impacts. And that is due to the increasing cost of fuel and production, and they significantly went up, but also due to the increasing fertilizer prices, which we must not forget. So if you ask me what we might see, so we might see a lower quality wheat with added high protein flour, for example, coming from legumes. We might see a lower quality wheat that may have a significantly higher mycotoxin content. And if this is basically added uh, or has added legumes, there might be undeclared allergens from the legumes. From the oil's perspective, we will see presumably sunflower oils mixed with other low quality oils, 
or even the replacement oil. So in this case, it could be soybean oil or it could be canola oil being adulterated itself because there will be a shortage of those oils as a consequence of trying to replace the sunflower oil. So there might be contaminated oils. Now, let me take you back to 2007. I don't know who remembers those days when we also had a crisis. And let's just look. So you see two lines here at the beginning. The top line are the food prices and the bottom line is the fertilizer prices. And very often they go hand in hand. And the fertilizer prices tend to be a good indicator a little earlier sometimes than the food prices that something is wrong in the market. But let's see how that develops. And you can see in 2008, those two curves peaked. And that was basically the time of the world food price crisis. And similar to the situation that we have now, we had as initial causes droughts in grain producing countries, a rise of oil prices, here it sees that the petrol prices, and a significant rise, and you can see that here in the fertilizer prices. And in 2008, we actually saw food price riots in several countries. And on top of that, if that wasn't enough, we also had the melamine incident in infant formula. Now, melamine is a particular molecule that is very nitrogen rich, and sometimes it's added to increase the apparent protein content. So here, it was used to increase the apparent protein content of milk, but it could equally be used if you use a certain uh, quantification technique called Gildel. It could equally be used for wheat, because now we have a shortage of wheat in the market. So that's something to watch out for. So history, unfortunately, repeats itself often enough for all the wrong reasons. So we might be in a situation where melamine becomes something to look out for again. So if we compare the 2007 and 2022 situation, you can see clearly the similarity, high fertilizer prices grain shortages, high oil prices. Well, in 27, 28, we had the melamine incident and we had food riots. So I think right now we have a perfect recipe for disaster. So how can we mitigate that risk? And Sami already mentioned the vulnerability assessment, but there is another tool that's testing. So one of the things that is uh, basically paramount for any food manufacturer is to revisit their vulnerability assessment in light of the changing market situation and the price situation. And one of the tools that you can use, there are several around, is the United States Pharmacopeia pre-screening tool. Um, I'm recommending this tool above other tools because it's, it's kind of a quick assessment. It gives you in a couple of minutes answer how likely your predominant, um, predominantly used ingredients are at risk of food fraud. And we published that in, um, in the journal of IFT. And you can find all these graphics in that publication. It's an open access publication. So it's a very straightforward process. So you start with basically looking at what are the most important ingredients to the company. You draw up a short list, then you group the ingredients. So are there spices, are there dairy ingredients, are there oil? And then basically identify all those that do require a vulnerability assessment. And here we've given you some guided tables of what you need to be looking at. Uh, for example, if you have a um, a raw material, let's say a peppercorn, and you're importing peppercorn, there is a slightly lower risk that the peppercorns are adulterated. They might, be, they might have their essential oils extracted, 
Uh, so that's another form of food fraud, but they will not be, there will not be other added ingredients, maybe papaya seed, but that would be easily detectable. Now, if you have ground ingredients, it's very easy to add other substances. So the risk as the ingredient is processed becomes significantly higher. So this is the basis of that vulnerability assessment. So here you go. And then basically at the end of the process, you identify and then take action, maybe an additional audit, maybe additional testing for those products. And our recommendation or my recommendation here is to revisit your vulnerability assessment in light of a change market situation, use a pre-screening tool and deep dive into the top risk ingredients identified by that tool. And then, and uh, Karen, I know she's online, uh, will talk about the, and I do apologize, I call it still discern as it's actually food chain ID now, the food fraud database, or another alternative is the DigiComply uh, database from SGS. So those are very valuable tools to monitor upcoming changes in different countries because both food fraud data or both databases basically give you an insight into what happened in other countries where you might be shipping your products from to your site. So you, you get basically advanced notice. So those are very essential tools. And I do recommend having at least one of those tools on board when you do your risk, uh, your vulnerability assessment. And when the situation changes, that means when you have a new supplier, when the prices change, it's always worth doing a revisit of your vulnerability assessment. And then, of course, you need to ask what is the result of the review of your supply chain disruption event? So what food vulnerabilities have you updated? What has changed in your prior to the uh, what, what you had prior to the uh, vulnerability assessment that you've done now? What are the changes? What are the countermeasures that you're implementing now? So all these questions need to be addressed. And then, of course, you have another point when you have the incoming raw material potentially from a new supplier, how do you test for them? How do you select which of the batches might be adulterated? And this part is equally important for food inspectors from government as it is for quality control managers of food companies. So one of the option is of course, random sampling. So let's say you get a hundred bags, and you pick two bags out of 100. So you have a one in 50 chance to find a bag that is adulterated. That's not a very good ratio. Um, and then you send it to the laboratory and it comes back negative, but you don't know if the other 98 batches or bags rather um, are adulterated. So do we have tools to, to prevent that? And similar, when you go as a food inspector to, to monitor a site, which of the tanks here would you sample from top, bottom, middle? Which of those canisters that you see here on the right hand side of the picture would you sample from this one? Or maybe is it this one that has the adulterated product or is it this one? So random sample is never a good approach. So this is where we need to look out for alternative tests that can be done on site that gives you a very quick idea of which of the bags or which of the containers might be the one containing the adulterated product. So the problem with testing in the lab is that it takes time. It's still essential, it's still necessary because you do simply not have the tools that a laboratory has the high, end resolu the high resolution mass spectrometry. You cannot have that on site. It's, it's almost impossible for, for most food manufacturer, but there might be other tools. And what do these tools need to provide? They need to be usable on location. They need to be usable fast. So basically point and shoot devices as we call them with no or very little sample preparation. And they can be used ideally for raw material buyers or quality control managers, or uh, if you work for the government for food inspectors. Do we have those devices? Well, yes, we do. 
And what we have done is we put a special section device uh, section together. Uh, you have a QR code here and it will appear on the next couple of slides. So if you want to get your smartphone out, uh, it will take you to an article where at the bottom of the article, you find a link to all these papers and they're again, open access. So Carmen Diaz and, and myself, we have put this special section on portable devices together. And here are a couple of the highlights of those special section. So here you have a handheld near infrared device that using point and shoot method, you hold it against the fruit and you can identify fairly rapidly if that fruit is fresh or not. Now that may not constitute an adulteration, but the next one certainly does. So if you sell a farmed fish as wild, it attracts a higher price because wild fish sells higher. Um, you have the same tool that you can use to identify if you have farmed fish or wild fish, point and shoot device in a matter of seconds. Similarly, if you, um, if you are in, in Europe, for example, you have imports of basmati that are exempt from, from levy, exempt from import tax, basically. And what you find more frequently in the past than now, because now there have been methods developed, is that the basmati rice that is exempt from the levy or has a lower levy is adulterated with non-basmati varieties. And here, again, using NIR, a point and shoot device, it allows you to differentiate at the point and shoot at in a, in a matter of seconds, if you have a basmati or not. And similarly, we talked about the, the sunflower oil uh, that is now in short supply. Here is an approach that was done as part of a uh, European uh, Commission project. And that is an olive oil multi-sensor. Basically, it works with three different sensors, spirometric sensor, near infrared and visual light sensor. And it is able to determine if your olive oil is truly extra virgin or if it has been blended with refined oils, with lampant oils, and so on. So we do have a number of tools at our hands. Of course, it's always a question of how well they are validated, but it's up to you, the inspectors and the quality control managers, to contribute to that and to take one of those sensors and help with the validation for your particular system. And it will allow you to not randomly select samples, but to basically go across 100 bags very quickly in a matter of seconds and identify if one of the spectra you're reading from the incoming raw materials is different from the others. And that's where you take a sample. And that's what you send to the laboratory. So with that, I conclude my first presentation and I'm happy to take any questions.